Hello and happy Tuesday. Uh, my name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at Bic Instruments. I'd like to, to welcome you to our uh, latest webinar on dispersing and milling for energy storage. Um, definitely an exciting topic uh, these days. So uh, today's presenter is Mr. Uh, Andy Stumer. He is our business line manager for dispersion uh, and milling. Uh, he'll be presenting today. Uh, also, if you have any questions, please log them in the uh, chat box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, I don't expect we'll have time to get to them. This is a, a pretty in-depth presentation, but uh, log them in and we'll make sure Andy or, or someone on the team follows up with you directly. Um, also, take note, we are recording this and immediately following, you'll receive an, a marketing automated uh, email with the link. So feel free to watch again and share it with colleagues, uh, whatever you like. So with that, uh, let me turn things over to our speaker, Mr. Mr. Andy Stumer. Andy, it's all yours, sir. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we're supposed to have this meeting a week ago. Unfortunately, I fell ill with the virus and uh, couldn't really talk. So today my voice is much better and uh, hopefully we get through this without any issues. Um, so just a quick introduction about modern energy storage. Then we go right into dispersing and milling process overview. Uh, we have also some exciting news and new development uh, for the particular market. And then we cover uh, lab and production equipment, um, different models we offer uh, for different uh, storage, energy storage uh, capabilities, uh, applications. And then we talk about lab capabilities at the end, uh, what we have in Germany and in uh, Wallingford, Connecticut at our sister company, Big USA. As you can already see on this slide, we cover everything where we offer models from small laboratory applications all the way up pilot and then manufacturing we even have larger models and what you can see on this picture right here for um, very large volume applications we're going to cover that as well so basically uh, most of you are familiar with lithium iron energy storage solutions so <clears throat> not a lot of use there but uh, the technology is really improving a lot especially the last few years um, we have seen really quite a good increase in performance, better range, power, and also with new developments, shorter charging times. So it's really important to select the right, right equipment, uh, right dissolvers, as well as milling uh, technology, uh, and as well as additives that go into these slurries uh, to give you really the best performance and development on also manufacturing uh, capabilities. Um, so solid state is kind of the next step up, uh, in the development process. Uh, so we have some good results there with our milling technology, especially those separators. Um, and then obviously big Gardner and VMA, um, we offer really some good solutions for the traditional lithium ion battery development process, as well as, as the new type of solid state batteries. And we have that new uh, dispermat design that we'll talk about shortly uh, to really give you optimum performance in the lab space pilot as well as uh, manufacturing. So just a quick uh, overview. So here is the demand for lithium ion batteries. Um, that was a uh, slide was shared to me, uh, given to me by our sister company, Big Additives. Uh, they supply some of the raw materials that go into these batteries and you can see uh, it's really exponentially how we are growing uh, in that industry. So a lot of, of good news stories there. And so our type of equipment, the dissolvers, as well as the different types of media mills, uh, including horizontal mills or the basket mill designs are really used to process different components that go into our slurries. Uh, you can see a list right here, silicones, different uh, electrodes, silicon oxides, lithium, all, also these uh, separators uh, made of ceramic uh, components and carbon graphite grinding 
uh, as well as dispersing carbon blacks going to these slurries, all of that, um, those additives <clears throat> or components um, are you uh, basically work really well with our different types of dissolvers. Um, so the bat battery development, so we have these electrolytes uh, that are inside of our battery uh, that allows basically the ions to flow in between the anode and the cathode. Um, they can either be fluids or solids. Um, and then basically these different acid salts generally act as these electrolytes in, in these slurries. Um, and we need to really have very good dispersing and milling equipment to develop uh, these electrolytes um, by basically reducing our particle size, have very good homogeneous slurries that will then improve our transfer efficiency of ion, ion particles moving uh, from the anode to the cathode. Um, so we have some of the different types of uh, mixing equipments and dispersing equipment. equipment. Uh, we'll be covering uh, that will help us to get better, better performance of our batteries. Okay. So here is the new Dispermat line for the renewable energy market. It's called the Dispermat AE dash RE for renewable energy and VLRE, which is a vacuum dissolver. Uh, they all come now with a new torque measurement system that is integrated. So we no longer measure uh, all the values like power, speed, uh, torque value through the frequency inverter. It's actually measured directly with its own uh, sensor mechanism. You can see that right here on that picture that's uh, attached to the shaft. And we are literally measuring very accurately the exact speed of the shaft, as well as the power and the torque value. All that data is transferred over to our control panel, and we can visually see the exact precise values of these measurements, much more precise than we would be getting with the standard uh, frequency inverter readout. Uh, so this is a whole new development, and there is also different sensors depending on the amount of torque the machine needs to uh, put in to uh, process the uh, different volumes of slurries. Uh, so we have extremely good repeatability and reproducibility uh, with this system. And obviously we don't need, no longer need the data from the frequency inverter. Everything is measured directly on the shaft with that new sensor. So it's a really good, reliable uh, development tool uh, <clears throat> as well as then obviously you can integrate the same system uh, into a pilot or manufacturing unit. So here's an example of um, new Dispermat AE renewable energy with the torque measurement system, how we uh, <clears throat> uh, mill or, or uh, homogenize uh, carbon black. And so here are the different ingredients that go in PVDF binders, different additives, our active materials. And obviously, idea is to develop a really good uh, cathode slurry um, with the carbon black. So here is an example of um, a, a system where we actually uh, pre-dispersed uh, with the CN20. Uh, which is one of the dispersers. This was before that new development, but it's based on the same platform. Um, also using a basket mill. So we started out at about 100 microns of particle size. Uh, we pre-dispersed the slurry with the cowl's blade for about one hour. And then uh, we milled with the basket mill TML1. We'll talk a little bit more in detail uh, about this technology for about three hours. And then we'll be, we were able to reduce our particle size to two microns on average, uh, which is really good. Very quick milling time, uh, very scalable. This was done in the lab space. We then later on did larger volumes uh, in our pilot scale facility, and we were able to get exactly the same uh, results uh, with our basket mill um, for that cathode slurry. 
So what happens right there is obviously in the dispersion process, we're trying to uh, wet our solid particles, a mechanical breakdown of our larger agglomerates, and then basically turn them into aggregates, which then in return, if we actually would do the real milling, would turn them into a primary particle size, which becomes really important when we are dealing with our separators where we need extremely small uh, particle size somewhat uh, in the lower nano range. And then at the end, we want to use the right additive package to really stabilize our particle particles when they are in a suspended state. Um, so here is actually the entire process. So we're wetting first, we are pre-dispersing with the cowl's blade, uh, and then when we reach the desired particle size of our aggregates and we want to go smaller, that's when we need to do actually the media milling. And then finally, we want to stabilize uh, our slurry with the right additives. Um, so here is an example. I will play this video here. So actually, John, uh, since you are hosting this uh, slide, maybe you can play the video. Uh, well, it's in the system. Videos are always an issue. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up here another way and share my screen if that would work. Let's do this. Okay, so if we're not able to basically, uh, basically on this video, we would be showing you how to uh, mill a carbon black uh, with the basket mill, TML1, what we talked about before we were able to reduce the particle size down to two microns in three hours of milling time. Um, so a big additive uh, was basically supplying us with the dispersing and wetting agent as well as the foamer called Leponite RD. Uh, we can also put you in touch with our colleagues at the, on the additive side that can talk to a little bit more about the specifics of these different additive packages. So here is an important slide. So we always want to start out with the dissolver, which is using the cowl's blade to basically mix and homogenize, uh, pre-disperse our slurry. And then when we reach about 30 microns of particle size, this is kind of the threshold down to about 10 microns, which is kind of the lower limit, what we can achieve with just the cowl's blade. That's when we want to start medium milling. So we can either use a basket mill or a um, horizontal bead mill or a vertical bead mill to accomplish that and then allows us to go down to really low nano range um, for very small particle size requirements. So we have two different steps. So we got the pre-dispersion step, we got a different types of dispermats, dissolvers, very important, 18 to 25 meters per second is our tip speed. That's what we're looking for. And then when we are grinding or milling, uh, we're looking for about 10 to 16 meters per second of our um, tip speed of our milling disc or our rotor. Uh, so we have vertical bead mills, basket mills, our tourist mill TML, which you saw previously. And then we also have the Dispermit SC with quick change system. Uh, which allows you to very quickly transition between a disperser as well as a basket mill, go back and forth. So you don't have to buy two pieces of equipment. Your entire um, development process can all be done on one piece of equipment, uh, which is really nice. Don't need as much lab space or manufacturing space. Everything can be really done on one machine. Or we have also the horizontal bead mills, which allow you to go down to super small particle size, smaller than 50 nanometers. We have our RS series for manufacturing, as well as the SL for uh, the lab space. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more in detail uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, so to start out with, we always want to make sure when we pre-disperse or we mix, we want to always use uh, the right dissolver disc to container ratio. Uh, we recommend about one third diameter of our blade to container. Um, and then basically on the right side here, there is a slide 
that will show you the uh, sweet spot for each container volume and the blade diameter that you should be using to properly predisperse uh, your slurry. Um, obviously, you have some ranges depending on the viscosity. Uh, so not one blade fits every container. So you can really see, for example, if I'm in the laboratory space, I have a one liter vessel. Uh, I can go anywhere from a 70 millimeter blade down to a 30. As long as I'm hitting uh, my tip speed of 18 to 25 meters per second, uh, I'm good. I can uh, use any blade uh, in that range uh, to, to make sure I produce a, a very good quality slurry. So the other important part is what we already talked about is the tip speed uh, calculation. So we have uh, tip speed calculated is the RPMs multiplied by uh, 3.14 and then also multiply that with the diameter of our dispersing blade. If we want meters uh, per second, we want to use that in metrics. So if I have a 50 millimeter blade would be, for example, 0 0.05 and then divide everything by 60. And that number should be anywhere between 18 to 25 meters per second. If I'm using a dissolver disc, if I'm milling, that should be anywhere between 10 to 16 meters per second. But the same um, formula applies to pre-dispersing as, as well as milling. That's a really important formula. Uh, you wanna write that down. It's not only about the RPMs, it's really about the actual tip speed. Um, this is also why you will see smaller lab units have much higher RPMs. We can go up to 20,000 and very large production machines have much lower RPMs uh, because of the diameter of the blade is much larger in a manufacturing environment than what you would see uh, in a laboratory space. So it's really all about the tip speed, what we need to watch out for. Then we have, uh, it's really called the donut effect, is a very important visual cue uh, that we actually see when we look inside of our container when we are predispersing. So when we optimize our dispersion parameters, optimize the tip speed, um, you should, and also the mill base, about 50% of the 50 to 70% our fill rate of our container. We don't want to go higher, otherwise we are spilling. And we optimize uh, the uh, parameters. We should really visually see the formation of a donut. You can see that really well right here. You want to see that the blade is somewhat exposed and that you can actually see uh, the center part uh, really well. That means we are probably optimizing or most likely optimizing our dispersion process also if our viscosity is in a good range and i'll explain that in the next few slides uh if the viscosity is too low we may still be predispersing but we won't see a donut because the donut would automatically collapse uh, once it's being formed so here is a good slide showing you where actually the breakup of these larger particles takes place. It's actually uh, at the lip of our blade. Also, you would have the same effect on the bottom. It's not on the picture here, but you would see both on the top as well as on the bottom where this deagglomeration uh, action actually takes place. Uh, here's an example of a slurry. Um, same effect applies uh, to a, a battery slurry. This picture was taken with the coating, uh, but you see an optimum dissolver prep right here. We are putting in 21 meters per second, uh, 850 watts of energy. So you can see the donut over here on the next one. We are putting in 320 watts of energy at the same tip speed, which means that the viscosity of our slurry is very low. Doesn't mean we are not dispersing, which just means the viscosity is so slow, no donut can be formed. So it'd probably be better to uh, modify it so you can increase the viscosity somewhat to get the donut and, and also to be able to put in more energy into the slurry, which is important uh, in our deagglomeration process. 
And here is an example of where we're putting in 900 watts of energy. We are uh, not seeing a donut. This means that the viscosity is really high and we are probably not able to ever see a donut. Uh, doesn't mean we are not dispersing. It just means that the viscosity uh, is just so high that we don't really get the donut formed. Okay, so for the pre-dispersion process, which is that first step, really important duration of our dispersion process, depending on our formulation, um, can be anywhere, you know, up to like one hour, what we have seen uh, certain applications, usually about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, but up to an hour. And then we wanna be able to see the donut effect ideally always try to stay within 18 to 25 meters per second of tip speed. Uh, again, we want to be about one third diameter ratio, our uh, impeller or dispersion blade to our container. Uh, also want to choose the right type of impeller. There's many different ones on the market, light duty, heavy duty, depending on, on, on the viscosity. We want to stick with about 50 to 70% uh, fill ratio, uh, not more, otherwise we are spilling. And if we have less than that, then um, we're not able to properly oscillate up and down. So that could be an issue as well. And if we are basket milling, uh, if we have less than 50%, the, the mill will actually touch the bottom of our container and that could also affect the milling performance. Uh, carbon black zirconium and filler concentration play a role. Uh, low temperature is important. We will try to be as cool as possible. So we have also double wall containers that will help with temperature regulation. And then again, the right additive package is important for better wetting, dispersing, no flocculation, and also uh, to keep the foam a, uh, in check. Uh, and then once we uh, achieve a go pre-dispersion result, we can then move over to a bead mill to get smaller particle size if we, if we need to. So the difference here really is obviously with a dissolver or a disperser, we only have a cow's blade. Uh, because we only use a cow's blade, the, lamp, the energy input is somewhat limited, meaning means also limited amount of shear force. It's really only for the first step to be agglomerate uh, and get us down to the aggregate level, not to the primary particle level. Uh, but it is a really critical step in any type of dispersion process that we first use a dissolver before we do any type of milling. Um, the reason is in mills, we have dynamic gaps. So we have screens and if our particles are too large, uh, the screens could get clogged or our dynamic gap would be clogged. Also, our beads may not have the right kinetic energy to really break up these binding forces of these larger particles. So we want to predisperse um, down to 30 microns, between 10 to 30 microns, and then we want to start the milling process. Will we able then to put in a lot more energy really break down to uh, primary particle size. Uh, again, with the basket mills, we're able to go down to about 500 nanometers. And for really small particle requirements, uh, like your separators, where we need sometimes smaller than 100 nanometers, uh, we really need to use a horizontal bead mill. That will obviously give us improved characteristics, better particle size, transparency, color strength, uh, or particle size distribution, or some of the effects that you would see uh, if you're uh, properly milling uh, your slurries. So what actually happens inside of a bead mill? Obviously, we're inside of a chamber, and the milling disc or the rotor will basically rotate at a high rate of speed, and then throw around these beads or the media that we have in the chambers. Uh, and then basically as these beads are drifting towards, towards each other, uh, that pushing action that the fluid dynamics will actually cause uh, the 
shear force to break up these binding forces. Uh, so that means that the larger particle gets pushed away with a really high velocity and then basically gets reduced to smaller particle size. Um, it's definitely some crushing action there as well, uh, but the probability of two partic a particle getting pushed uh, between two beads is relatively small. So most of your particle size reduction uh, will actually help, uh, will actually be caused by these, uh, the shearing motion of, of the beads drifting towards each other at high velocities. Uh, so at that point, we're able to reduce the particle sizes below 10 microns. And we're also wetting. Uh, we need to stabilize with the right additives. And really, this is the real breakdown to the primary particle size uh, inside of a bead mill. Um, very important, the kinetic energy uh, of our beads during the milling process. So you might uh, want to write down that formula and weight of beads and peripheral speed of our rotor is our tip speed. Um, that will give us the uh, kinetic energy of our, of our beads during the milling process. So very important when we are milling, we want to use high quality uh, zirconium oxide beads. Uh, they're much heavier, much harder than, for example, glass. You can see right here, uh, specific weight is 6.1 versus 2.5. Uh, so our kinetic energy is much higher. Uh, also, the wicker hardness is much higher on a zirconium oxide bead versus on a glass bead. Uh, so always go with higher quality beads. Uh, you will have much better results. Also, glass tends to break up during the milling process. You end up with shards and your slurry, uh, which would not happen with the uh, zirconium oxide. Um, for example, these are serum, st serum stabilized. We also have yttrium stabilized uh, beads as well. So, but stay away uh, from glass. Uh, they are no good. Um, here is a good slide. You can see the larger particles um, and then the beads colliding towards each other, drifting towards each other, causing a lot of um, mo pushing movement of, of the beads inside of the slur, of the, of the particles inside of the slur, which actually breaks up these binding forces. And it's happening in these corners right here where that action actually takes place. So here are some critical parameters we have to watch out for. Again, particle size after pre-dispersing, 10 to 30 microns. Then we're gonna move over to milling. Bead size, very important. Uh, we don't wanna use super small beads if our particles are still 10 to 30 microns. We wanna use one to 1.2 millimeter beads is kind of the sweet spot. The standard screen size we have in our basket mills is 0.5. Um, so if you want to go with something smaller, you really should mill um, the slurry down with larger beads before you move to smaller bead sizes. Um, we can go down all the way to 0.1 millimeter bead size, depending on the final desired particle size. Um, again, specific weight of the beads, try to stay with ceramic. Uh, they are much heavier than glass. Uh, amount of beads plays a role. So they all have uh, different requirements, whether you use horizontal, basket mill, or vertical bead mill. Uh, shape of the beads, really important after milling. Um, so many cycles. You should ideally always screen the beads, get rid of the fines. Uh, and, and also, you know, when you're using or you shouldn't be using glass, that's when you see that there are shards inside of your slurry. You want to um, don't want to deal with that. So basically always try to stick with ceramic. And then again, tip speed when we are milling 10 to 16 meters per second, a little bit slower than when we pre-disperse. Uh, but that's the recommended range. Uh, product temperature, we're going to put in a lot of energy. Uh, during the milling process, so product temperature is going to go up very rapidly. So we definitely want to be able to cool not only our, our milling systems, but
but also the supply vessels or containers that we are milling in. So they need to be double walled. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, then obviously the number of passes either through my milling chamber or my basket mill uh, will influence um, the speed of my milling as well as the final particle size. Milling time, the residence time of my product inside of a milling chamber, if I pump it through really fast, okay, it's not going to be in contact with the beads for so long. So basically the longer it stays in the milling chamber, uh, the more milling action I get and the, the smaller my particles will become eventually. Uh, viscosity of the mill base, very important. If I have very thick slurry, very thick zootropic, I can't really use a basket mill. So the sweet spot there is about three to 5,000 centipoise. Uh, however, we can mill much larger, but it will, uh, viscosity, but it will take longer for the product to cycle through the mills. Um, and then obviously if our viscosity is too low, um, we can still mill, but it will also take longer because we're not able to put in as much energy due to our low viscosity. So that will then increase our milling time. And then again, the different types of bead mills, horizontal basket mill or vertical bead mill uh, will definitely influence our final milling result, particle size as well as, well as uh, milling time. So our dispersers with dispermats, um, they're well known in the industry. They have one key advantage uh, is that they're all modular. So you can see our uh, clamping device uh, on top, the clamping ring. You remove it, you turn that assembly 180 degrees and you can basically pull out the shaft and then replace it either with the rotor stator, with the vacuum system, basket mill on the bottom right. We have a wall scraping system or vertical bead mill. Excellent solutions for lab space. Uh, and means you only need one piece of equipment for uh, many different uh, types of milling or dispersing uh, formulations and requirements. So here is the uh, RE model, uh, basically with the torque measurement sensor, uh, you can see the really nice C control display that will give you all the data on the screen your speed, the amount of energy you're putting in, the torque value, uh, which is an indirect measurement of your viscosity or change in viscosity. Uh, we also have the tip speed on the top right. Uh, we have a timer function and as well as a temperature readout on display. All the data can be stored either on the actual uh, control panel or sent over to a computer where you then can review or view the dispersion process or milling process in real time, store the data. Actually, this particular C technology also allows you to create recipes for different formulations. And the next time when you're running it, it'll be able to recall everything that you're putting in, all the presets, energy input, speed, um, as well as cutoff values. If you have a certain threshold uh, that you can exceed, for example, with your temperature, then you can put in a warning level. Let's say 50C is the maximum. I can have a warning at 40C, at 45C, a second warning. And at 50C, the machine would either shut off or run at a different speed. So you can then attach all these uh, presets to a recipe, and they can all be stored on board or on a computer. Um, for uh, use at a later time or when you want to replicate the exact same uh, trial or process. We also have explosion proof models available. Uh, in some instances, customers require those. Uh, same systems available for lab pilot as well as plant level. Uh, we use no uh, only direct drive brushless motors. If you have worked on a dispermat, ultra quiet, you can hardly hear them when they're running, hardly any vibration of the motor. There is no belts or anything. The shaft goes right into the motor and it's direct drive. So it's a really, really well-designed motor and, and, and dispermat system. Uh, so this here is uh, the new VL 
uh, renewable energy system. Uh, we have that model with the torque measurement sensor integrated. Uh, this machine allows you to basically disperse under vacuum. Uh, you can turn on the vacuum where you don't have to. Uh, it has a basically uh, a closed system uh, with a viewing glass on top that allows you to also open that uh, viewing glass to add more product, more powder or liquid additive. And then basically, depending on the viscosity, you can, you can either engage or disengage uh, a, a sweeper blade uh, to ensure that all the slurry gets properly dispersed and the container walls are scraped free. Um, you can then turn on the vacuum. Um, either during the dispersing process, it runs the entire time, or you just run it once, then close the uh, valve and then basically maintain the certain, a certain vac vacuum pressure inside of your vessel. Um, some customers also want to do uh, dry dispersing. We can add a nitrogen purging valve, an inner gas. That's also an option uh, that we can add on to the same system. And again, the torque measurement system gives you real time, 100% accurate values of torque, speed, and also energy input. And we have lower cost models. This is a model for the, you know, entry level, low cost, um, small benchtop applications, uh, just really a standard dissolver, also fully modular. You can add different milling accessories. It gives you a timer function as well as your speed dial. And then um, the disadvantage I wanna point out on this particular model this is my opinion is that you have to manually raise or lower the shaft. You can see on the left, that le right side, that lever, you loosen that and that allows you then to move the uh, motor head with the shaft up and down along the stand. Um, personally, I don't like it that much because it's difficult to oscillate or find the sweet spot of the blade inside of the container. Um, I much rather prefer the CV line, which actually very similar, except here you have the ability to raise and lower your shaft electronically. Also the CV gives you a temperature readout, which is really important, especially when we are milling. Uh, it also gives you a torque value. Again, the torque value displayed here is calculated by the frequency inverter and is not perfectly accurate, like what you would get with the new renewable energy systems uh, that integrate that torque measurement sensor. And that can only be integrated on our higher end models that I uh, showed you earlier. But with the CV, we can make up to seven liters of slurry. Again, fully expandable. You can turn this into a basket mill or a vertical bead mill with an APS system. I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, rotor stator or a vacuum system. And we have the CN, which is a little larger system that also uh, allows you to go up to pilot range within the same model family, same motor design, brushless step motor, uh, ultra quiet, gives you uh, again, speed, percentage of torque, temperature and timer, uh, no torque measurement sensor like we have on the higher end model, but still gives you good data. And again, scalable within the model range. Ideally, if you wanna have the same system for lab as well as pilot and small scale manufacturing, you can stay within the same product family. Here is the same model for larger volumes, uh, but it gives you the same control capability. It's called the CN line. And then we have our flag, flagship line, which is the AE, now with the renewable energy uh, layout. And that basically um, comes with that C technology package. Um, here you can see a double wall container with the jackets. And then again, fully expandable to different milling systems, vacuum systems. Also within the same product family, we can go all the way up to pilot and small scale manufacturing. Um, again, the C technology allows you to store the data, send it over to a computer. We have a software called Windisp 
and then explosion proof models are available as well within the AE range, uh, which uh, is really nice. They also come with what is called a net power calibration, which basically allows you to reset the machine to uh, all the values to a complete zero point, like the energy. So when you turn it on, you run that net power calibration feature, it will run without any product for 30 seconds and then reset all its values uh, to a zero point so that when you're actually running product, there is no um, contamination of the values from the actual machine input itself. So all the values will be related directly to your slurry and not the machine input. Uh, and here again, AE for large scale, upscale uh, to production. Um, this is a small scale production. I'll show you the large scale production in a minute here. Again, same C technology package, what we already covered, giving you good upscale capability from lab pilot to manufacturer. Then we have uh, horizontal bead mills in our portfolio. So we have the SL for the lab space and then for manufacturing the RS systems. These units are awesome, especially if you really want to go very, very small particle size. Uh, we offer full zirconium line milling chambers, zirconium rotors, really important for uh, battery development. We can't have any metal contamination in our slurry. So we have those um, uh, capabilities in our uh, small laboratory scale models, as well as our large manufacturing models. Um, you can run them either in circulation mode or pass through mode. Um, the smaller units you can see have the supply vessel attached to the actual milling chamber. Uh, above that is a, is a small motor with the shaft and a pumping system that will actually force our slurry inside of the milling chamber. And then it gets recirculated back into our supply vessel. We have the ability to cool not only the supply vessel, but also the actual milling chamber as well, where you have cooling jackets for ultimate uh, temperature control. Also the same temperature control capability exists uh, also for our manufacturing scale RS systems. Here are the different volumes uh, for the manufacturing scale horizontal bead mill. Uh, volumes in liters per hour, so we can really produce some massive amounts of product. Uh, and we have actually gone larger for some custom applications. So if you're really looking to produce massive volumes, uh, we can uh, definitely help you there uh, with a customized solution. Again, ceramic option, all um, zirconium lined, as well as zirconium rotors. And we have the manufacturing scale. We can go up to about 2,000 liters of product volume, uh, roughly about a little bit less, 600 gallons. Um, output, 55 kilowatts. We have different control capabilities. So we have the standard SPS or SC, and then we have a Siemens control panel. If you want to integrate a scale, we have that ability to also offer this package as well. Um, we have a vacuum capability uh, with the SC. Uh, we offer a wall scraping system for really thick, thick materials. Uh, if you want the entire slurry to be processed um, with the wall scraper, that's an add-on. Um, that's also helpful for slurries that are very thick, so tropic. And then we also offer explosion-proof designs. And the quick change system, again, I talked about it earlier, is available that allows you to seamlessly move from a dissolver over to a basket mill. So they are very, very quick change systems. I can move from a disperser to a basket mill. In about three minutes, I can move from one to the other. So I only need one piece of machinery for my entire dispersion and milling process instead of buying multiple pieces of equipment. So that's a big advantage. Here you can see how the quick change system works. So I start out with a dissolver and then I'm ready to do milling and I just swap out the uh, dispersing blade for a basket mill. 
And again, we have full ceramic option, zirconium lined milling chamber, as well as zirconium milling disc uh, with our basket mill systems. This is the stand um, that um, will come with the machine that basically allows you then to move seamlessly between a dissolver and a basket mill, all on the same machine. Then we have the Dispermit SC with the vacuum system, uh, allows us basically to better wet uh, and disperse some materials. It allows us to remove any type of foam uh, for more homogenous uh, type of dispersing action, um, cost savings and small, I don't have to use really deformers. There is variable vacuum pumps depending on the product volume. Again, we can offer that nitrogen purging valve and it's really designed for a large scale manufacturing all again, up to 2000 liters of product. We have also, this is a really interesting concept. Uh, this is the two in one system where before I showed you where you're moving between a disperser as, and the basket mill on one machine. Here I have both systems integrated in one machine uh, at all times. So I pre-disperse first, and then when I'm ready to do milling, I don't have to make any changes. I just push a button on my control panel, and then I can lower a basket mill, and now I have a fully functioning basket mill system. Also on one machine, here the product volume is somewhat less. We can go up to 1,600 liters with that type of design. It's called the Dispermat TM. Again, here you can see another slide of the TM. Once we're completed with the pre-dispersing, we push a button, the basket comes down and now we have the, the, uh, the basket mill. Of course, huge advantage, space savings, time savings. I, can, I don't have to move containers around from one machine to another. I can do everything on one machine. Uh, simple cleaning. I don't have to move baskets. I can literally uh, do the entire dispersing and milling process on one machine pretty much at the same time without having to make any changes. We get really good milling results with our basket mill design. Um, I showed you that earlier. So these are awesome machines. The threshold there is about 500 nanometers. Uh, if we want to go lower, we really need to move over to a horizontal bead mill. Here is uh, two uh, systems, TM1000s installed at a customer, same machines. Uh, the cowl's blade is uh, not installed yet. It's behind the gentleman on the left. And you can see the basket mill uh, right on top below the cover. And then over here on the right side, it's the same machine, except uh, it's collapsed, it's lowered. That's what it would look like when you are basically running uh, the machine when you're pre-dispersing and then the uh, basket comes down when you're milling. Also, may I mention very quiet, that stepless, uh, that brushless step motor design uh, allows for really quiet operation um, and headset worn to communicate with Germany, um, but not running the machine yet. So, but very, very quiet. Uh, here is an up close view of the basket mill. So double walled, excellent cooling capability. So we have these bars right here. Uh, on the right side is a coolant or water in, and then on the left, water coolant out. Uh, we have a third bar in the background that is actually used to measure the temperature inside of our basket mill. And that uh, uh, screw right here basically uh, it gets removed to add the beads to our basket mill. We have a very efficient basket mill design. Our screen is on the bottom. We don't have screens on the side like some of our competitors. The huge advantage is that there is much less wear on the equipment. Uh, because of the way that the beads get thrown around inside of the milling chamber, if you have screens on the side, this is where you will experience most of the wear. So 
that's one reason. The second reason is uh, most of your energy uh, gets created right in that area. So we want to be really, um, you know, have a very good cooling uh, in that particular zone. So we removed the screen uh, and basically made that whole thing double walled for excellent cooling capability. To draw the slurry out of the container, we used the cow blade on the bottom and we can then effectively draw basically our slurry out of the out of the basket and then push it back to the top. So a huge advantage there. Uh, again, uh, we don't have any seals or washes like what you would have in a horizontal bead mill. Excellent temperature control. We also offer vacuum system. Uh, and basically, we have an integrated pumping and steering wheel to draw uh, the slurry into our basket. And then here is your milling disc with the screen right below. A very, very nice design. Here you can see that on the left side where um, basically the slurry gets drawn out of the uh, basket through the screen. So the beads are kept in there. And then basically they get pumped to the top uh, with the uh, cow's blade, uh, pushes it up. And then that pumping and steering system uh, will create a vortex and then suck it back in. So we have very efficient motion uh, in and out of our basket. Really good design. Then we also offer what I talked about earlier, the vertical bead mill APS system. This is more for a lab space, not really for large scale manufacturing. We can go up to about 35 liters of slurry uh, with this system. So we basically have two containers, uh, a top container and the bottom container. On the top container, we have our slurry. If we want to mill, we just add beads. We place the cow's blade with the milling disc, and then we are milling. Uh, you can see on the bottom of that container, there is a screen in here and a drain plug. Um, when we are ready to purge our slurry, we uh, plug an air hose into our cover and then basically pressurize our chamber and force the slurry out of the container into the catch pan or another container below. So that will be our milled material. Uh, once that is fully milled, I can put the drain plug back in place and then add cleaning fluid or any type of solution with the right polarity, run it for a few minutes, purge it out the same way. Uh, and that's how I'm cleaning uh, my, my APS system. Very efficient, but again, small scale, perfect for lab space to do a lot of samples very quickly, all the way to small scale pilot. Not really suitable for large scale manufacturing, just because if I have 2000 liters, um, I would need a lot of beads um, to really melt the material. It becomes very inefficient at that scale uh, because we can add 100% of our um, uh, slurry. We can add in beads. So if I have uh, 500 milliliters of slurry, I can add 500 milliliters of beads. So we have a lot of milling action going on in our small uh, containers. Uh, just different uh, control panels here. So you can see that C technology uh, with the new, for the new renewable energy package, uh, we have the speed uh, display top left. We have the energy input in watts. Uh, we have a torque value displayed on the uh, tip speed on top right. We have a temperature readout as well as our timer function. Um, the device also comes with that safety, uh, those safety features, a container clamping system. You can see we have uh, two buttons right here. They allow you to set a threshold for the lower limit as well as the upper limit inside of your container. So you would preset that before you start dispersing or milling to ensure that basically you can operate within those two set points. If some were, somebody were to inadvertently push the up button and it would pass the threshold that you set, the machine would automatically power down or stop at that reference point so that there would be no way somebody gets injured with the, this spinning disc outside of the container. 
also for the bottom threshold that would ensure that you wouldn't be hitting the container bottom with the disk or, or the milling system. You can also add a light feature to see what's going on inside of the container. You can add an oscillation feature that basically allows for the shaft to move up and down uh, at different rates, uh, depending on what, what materials you're trying to process. On the right side here, you see the simple version of the control panel, more for manufacturing, very easy. Sometimes in these manufacturing environments, it gets very dirty or dusty. So this is a, a more sturdy approach to the control of the machines. Then we have a lab space available in Germany, uh, where we actually build all of our machines. Uh, we can have you there to do some trials on the equipment, uh, proof of concept testing. Uh, we also have a large upscale and small manufacturing facility. If you wanted to uh, see how the larger basket mills or horizontal bead mills functions or the solver uh, with your slurries, we can uh, set that up. And then here in North America, uh, we have a smaller lab. This is some of the new equipment we added for uh, doing small lab trials um, in our Wallingford facility. Uh, the advantage there is we work in conjunction with our uh, sister company, the Big Additives team, and they have some really good innovative solutions uh, for electrolyte as well as uh, uh, separator development and processing. So we offer different types of surface additives, defoamers, as well as um, dispersing additives that go into your uh, elect electrolytes uh, cathode or anodes or the separator of material. So if you come and visit, we can uh, then tie in one of the chemists to give us support on the development side to ensure that you get optimum performance, not only from the equipment side, but also uh, with the additive packages. So the Wallingford site in Connecticut uh, is located at our sister company, Big USA. It's a first class laboratory facility. Uh, we have the Battery Additive Development Center, uh, all for energy storage solution processing. Uh, so we can really show you the type of equipment for your application, uh, run different um, trials on the different uh, milling systems. Uh, we can also scale up uh, as well. Uh, we don't unfortunately have really large uh, scale We're in the process of adding that capability, uh, but we do have that in Germany. And then again, we can really uh, leverage those synergies we have with the additive business and our instruments business really nicely. Um, the lab is great. Uh, we can use it also as a showroom if you want to come in and look at the equipment without actually running material. We can set that up and then it also functions as a training location or a seminar location. Uh, for our customers. And that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining me today. Great information, Andy. Um, as always, we appreciate the time and expertise. Um, like I said, you'll be getting a, uh, an e a marketing email, automated email um, immediately following this, uh, where you'll have a link to this recording. Feel free to share it with colleagues. Um, if you have any questions at all, just hit reply. Um, it'll come back to uh, our marketing team and we'll route it to the right technical expert. Uh, also, uh, Andy and I are working on a, a pretty extensive white paper around uh, dispersion and milling for energy storage. Um, so stay on the lookout for that. As soon as we get that done, we'll uh, definitely get it on our website and uh, uh, promote that out to you. So uh, with that, have a great rest of your day. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on future Pick Instruments uh, webinars. So uh, thank you. And uh, thanks again, Andy. Thank you.